As a Knicks fan, obviously, I've had nothing to root for in the playoffs for almost my entire life. So lately, at least the Rockets have been that kind of team I've adopted. I really like James Harden. I really like him as a scorer. And I just kind of, I want, he feel like he's the, one of those guys that deserves a ring. And I'd be really happy for him to kind of get one. But um, like I said, especially with the way he keeps performing these big games, I hope, I hope, like I said, it's the, it's the matchup thing this year, specifically in the bubble, and that he can kind of you know, go off against the Lakers and make it an interesting and fun series. So I'm Keith Smith, NBA reporter for everywhere, Yahoo Sports, Real GM, Celtics Block, Front Office Show. You find all Keith's work on Twitter at Keith Smith NBA. So I just said Celtics block, Keith. That's a team you focus on a lot. You, you know really well. But I had one of the questions I asked uh, earlier today in the show was, who the hell is in, in control of the East? Who is the team to beat in the East? Right? You have the Bucks down 0-2. You have the Raptors down 0-2. Both the Heat and Celtics look great. Is it the Celtics? Is it the Celtics conference to lose right now in the East? Uh, I don't know that it go quite that far because I'm not counting out Milwaukee or Toronto just yet. I know they, they put themselves in pretty big holes, and it's unlikely. Either one of them will win the series now, but Toronto was down 2-0 in this point last year and came back and won, and, and now it's having to go on the road, and they don't have to do that this time around. So so that's even more important. So so I think you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see you know how, how this plays out ultimately here, but it is um, – you know, it, it's going to be interesting. I think the Celtics present very unique matchup issues for Toronto, Boston. So much gets made of how small they are because they don't play with a true, you know, seven foot center at really any minutes during their game. But everywhere else, they're pretty big, especially with, um, you know, Marcus Smart in there. And then, yeah, right now they're without Gordon Hayward, but but their wings are are all big. They're they they're bigger or the same size than every player on the Raptors. So that's where they are really taking advantage of their size. They're able to create offense in the half court when the game slows down far easier than Toronto is. And that's why I felt good about Boston in this series that I thought they could really do some damage against them. So, so they're going to be tough. Now, if they get Miami, you're talking about a team that, again, uh, two teams that are pretty similarly sized and they've had some, some good battles. The Celtics had some success against the heat early on in the regular season. And then Miami got them in the bubble, but yeah, it, it's right now. It looks like it's going to be those two teams, but, but don't, don't, uh, don't bury the Raptors and the Bucks just yet. All right, so if you don't bury them, right, Bucks are obviously both are down 0-2. Who is, who is the, a better chance to come back? Is it the Bucks over the Heat, or do you think it's the Raptors? Again, this spot last year in the Eastern Conference Finals did it against the Bucks, came back down 0-2. Who's in the better position of the top two seeds in the East to make a comeback and advance to the Eastern Conference Finals in your mind? I think it's Milwaukee, and the only reason I say that is we could get to game three and you could see Giannis shoot 25 free throws and Chris Middleton score 30 points, and all of a sudden the Bucks look really good again. But the problem is they've got to change their defensive style. Mm-hmm. Offensively, they're, they're doing okay. You know, they, they, they're they doing the best they can with the pieces they have. They just don't have a lot of guys who can create offense off the dribble. They, they're very structured in the way they create offense. But defensively, they're sticking to this rigid drop principle with Brooke Lopez. Uh, they're giving up three-pointers, which their defense is designed to do. But Miami wants three-pointers, and Miami wants to pull up comforts. And that's exactly what the Heat are content to go to. Miami is very happy to let the shot clock go all the way down to, you know, two, three left on every possession if that's what it takes to get the best shot. And just Milwaukee, part of how they beat teams in the regular season, roll up all these blowouts is teams go cold and then teams panic. And then they start forcing the ball inside. And then the next thing you know, the Bucks rip off, you know, a 12-15-0 run and the game's a blowout and and it's no longer close. The Heat are playing it a little slower. They're they're taking good shots that they want to take, and that's tough. Orlando gave kind of the, the, the blueprint or the path to beating the Bucks in the first round, and they were just overwhelmed by the talent of the ball. And that's you know, going to be different. But, yeah, it's very interesting to see how this all comes together. So I'm with Keith Smith, Emmy reporter for Yahoo Sports, Celtics blog, all over the map. Find his great work at Keith Smith. NBA on Twitter. Keith, I guess two more questions for you. I do want to kind of zone in here on the, on the Celtics Raptors series specifically because, like you mentioned, you give the Bucks a better chance to come back um, against the Heat than the Raptors do against the Celtics. I would agree with you there. And part of the reason why I've kind of lost a little faith in Toronto has been just a disappearing act of Pascal Siakam, not just in the playoffs this year, but since he's really gotten to the bubble. He's kind of never really gotten into a groove, gotten back to the pre-pandemic, pre-stoppage play that he was at. Is there one thing that you kind of watch that he's really struggling with for whatever reason? Is it I don't know if it's more just the mental um, struggle of being there. We see that that way in a lot of players, including Paul George of the Clippers, or is it just something that schematically these teams are doing that throwing at him that he's you know as a young player still hasn't been really able to adjust to yet. 
Yeah, I can't speak to the mental side because I don't know, and he hasn't spoken about that as far as I know. Beyond the general, all the players have talked about how tough it's been to be away from their families for this kind of, you know, length of time and those kind of things. And let's not forget the Raptors got to Florida earlier than everybody else did because of the whole border issue and all those. So so they, they had it very different different than a lot of teams. But as I look at, at on the court, what you're seeing with the outcome that, that I really, you know, worry about with him and him kind of, you know, to figuring it out against the Celtics is they just they're a really good matchup for him. They know he wants to play off the dribble and get into the paint and do his spin moves and his up and unders and those kind of things. And the Celtics are prepared for it. They're ready for every counter he has. And then what they've done is and then when all right, you want to be a shooter? Go ahead. If we, if we lose because Pascal Siakam knocks down five or six three pointers, so be it. Then we're going to lose, and that that you know it is what it is. But Boston is not going to not not going to worry about that. They're worried about containing him off the dribble. The other thing the Celtics have baited the Raptors into with Siakam is these straight post up plays. Those are not good plays. So those are you know that's not what he does. That's not, uh, you know, anything that Toronto has really used a lot. And they've done it quite a bit with both him and Serge Ibaka. And, again, if the Celtics lose because those two are scoring off straight post-ups, then so be it. That, that'll be what it is. And, and one thing to watch with that, if it comes back, it, it's gotten less. It was really kind of um, excised from the offense by the end of uh, the, the second half of game two. But if they start tuning in game three, Watch how long it takes them to get the ball entered to those guys in the post. They're taking, you know, 10, 15, 20 seconds of the shot clock to get the ball in there, and that's really making it tough on them. As you know, too, like you said, especially their half-court offense, Toronto struggle at times. The transition offense, when they get especially right, getting Pascal Asakam, running, and just getting him driving to the hoop is always when they're, uh, they're at their most dangerous. Celtics have done a great, great, great job so far with containing them, um, which is why, at least to me, I, I'm buying into the Celtics, personally. I know you, you're still a little little hesitant. Um, and maybe, I mean, to be honest, Keith, I, I do like to jump the gun a little bit. I really thought the, the Lakers were in real trouble um, against the Blazers, and obviously after game one, look, look how that turned around. Uh, so maybe I am jumping the gun a little bit here. But I do want to finish at least with that Lakers and the Clippers, um, finally, because they both obviously had their own kind of scares. Maybe there are a little bit of flaws revealed in the first round, both against the Mavericks and the, the Blazers, respectively. Or either in your mind, you know, the Clippers and the Nuggets or the Lakers and the Rockets in, in real serious trouble in this second round? Um, I don't think so. I think both of them will win. I don't. I think, you know, you're, you're going to see the Clippers probably take care of business in five or six. I think the Lakers, they, they have the potential to win in five. Um, they, that, that one, I mentioned it earlier, Harden and Westbrook could score a whole bunch of points. And that one could, could go, um, you know, slightly differently. So, so we'll see you know, how that goes. But I think the Lakers are just, you know, LeBron James and Anthony Davis, they, there's no answer for those two guys from the Rockets. So the Rockets are going to want to, you know, get that game sped up a little bit, play a higher scoring game and try to force the Lakers into somewhat of a shootout, which is not how the Lakers want to play. They, they don't want to play fast. They don't want to get up and down like that. Then on the other side with the Clippers, I think what's interesting with the Clippers and the Nuggets is I think the Clippers, were able to figure some stuff out about who they are in that first round against Dallas, despite it being a challenging series for them. They were hopeful to use the eight seeding games in the bubble to really say, you know, all right, these are our rotations. These are the lineups that work because that team had been together very few um, games, if any at all, with their full roster. And what they were able to do is figure some stuff out in that series. Their one answer, the one player they don't have an answer for is Nikola Jokic. They're going to have to probably do some double teaming and make things tough on him. But everybody else there, they can defend. You can throw a host of different guys at Jamal Murray. And I think Denver is going to find it very hard to score on the Clippers if they're locked in defensively. Another thing going for both the Clippers and the Lakers, too, is just, I mean, both you saw, especially Jamal Murray post game when he found out they're playing a day or two days later. And you see, with at least with the Rockets, too, like they both just look drained and exhausted. That, that every other day format is really starting to catch up to a lot of these teams that play deep series and both at least the Clippers and the Lakers, the Lakers especially. Plenty of time to rest, get LeBron James's legs ready to roll. And like you said, too, it's, I'm hoping for a good series. I'm not expecting one, but fingers crossed. The bubble so far has been the great equalizer. So hopefully some great games continue. Find this man at Keith Smith NBA. All his great work for Yahoo, Real GM, Celtics blog, front office show. Keith Smith, NBA. Keith, thanks so much for the time. I really do appreciate it. And uh, keep up the good work. 
Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Y'all stay safe. You and yours.